thank you for the Testament team for bringing me out. And uh, interestingly, I, this is not my first time in Vilnius. I actually was here 27 years ago. I, uh, I had studied in Budapest, Hungary, and had $200 left. So with a friend, spent half of that on a train to get up to up to these Baltic countries and the other half to stay in a hotel every two or three nights and sleep in parks and on benches the other nights. But uh, I have to tell you, Vilnius has come a long way since I, since I saw it 27 years ago. I have too. I was, I was much smellier back then because I was not staying in very many hotels. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and to talk to you guys about growth hacking. So growth hacking is something that uh, I actually really started doing uh, for it at a couple of companies that we started in, uh, in Budapest, Hungary. So we started Log Me In in Budapest, and then before that, a company called Uproar.com, which became Uproar. We started in 1995, and it became uh, the number eight website in the world and was a gaming site, so the number one gaming website. We sold it to a company called Vivendi Universal, and then after we sold that, we started Log Me In, and then I've had a chance to work on some other great companies. And so I, I, what I realized, so par partly I had not been trained kind of in traditional marketing, and I had actually invested in the very first company I joined. So I was really focused on how, how do you actually create something that's successful and was a lot less worried about looking good or trying to, trying to do things the way that they've always been done, which it turned out that was a really good approach to have because it was the very early days of the internet where there's a lot of opportunities uh, and different ways you can grow with the internet. So I've, I've kind of used a different approach from the beginning, but I also found when I moved to Silicon Valley uh, in 2008, or actually late 2007, that there were some other really fast growing companies that also were using a different approach. And so I put a name on it called growth hacking, but it's not something that uh, I necessarily invented. I just put a name on it because I saw companies growing really fast using this different approach. So um, that's what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about one, what is growth hacking? How is it that companies are using this approach to grow very quickly? And then the next thing I'll talk about is it's not just about growth. If you, if you grow and then you very quickly fall, then what's the point? So it's, it's about sustainable growth, doing something that you can build something great over time and, and it continuing to be big and great. And then, uh, and then we'll talk about, so growth hacking is about experimentation. And the challenge of growth hacking is that you need to experiment not just in the marketing side of things, but really across all parts of the business. So how you acquire, convert, and activate new customers, and how you retain those customers. And so we'll talk about some of the complexities of that, which takes me into the last part, which is some of the barriers to success and what can prevent you being successful with growth hacking is that it requires not just one group of people to think about a different way to operate the business, but really the entire business has to, has to rethink growth, and that's why I call this presentation Rethink Growth. So let's start with what is the purpose of growth hacking, and it's, it's to create something that is, is life-changing and, and really impacts people in different ways. And so when you look at some of the companies that have emerged in recent years, they've changed the way we do everything from the way we shop, everything I buy now, I, the, my first instinct is to pull out my phone and order something from Amazon. And uh, even, even when I know I could get it in 10 minutes if I just drove to the store, it's just often so much easier to just pull out my phone and order it. Um, there's a company called Acorns that I'll take you through and, and uh, I'll talk about how that, that company is changing the way uh, young people invest. And most, most young people didn't invest at all before and now a lot of them, at least in North America are, are much more active investing because of this app called Acorns. Uber, of course, changes the way we get around. It's just amazing that I can arrive at the Vilnius airport and uh, fortunately, uh, Jan <laughs> Jonas came and picked me up, but uh, if I wanted to, I could just pit push a button and, and an Uber would come, come and get me. And uh, I can do that in countries around the world. It's just really easy to get from point A to point B. And then of course, Airbnb, makes it so that I can, I can stay anywhere I want. And uh, you know, there's, it's just a, it, it changes the way that, that we uh, travel and, and get around. But, but of course, it, there's a lot of pain that comes with it as well. So if you're a taxi company, you probably 
don't like Uber very much or Bolt or any of the other companies that are out there uh, disrupting the taxi industry. The hotel companies don't like Airbnb. The local stores don't like, uh, don't like Amazon. That there's, there's a lot of pain for the companies that have not been able to operate in, in as flexible a way to, to quickly capture growth and, and, uh, and reach customers and, and keep customers. So the companies that are doing it effectively are taking a very different approach to growth, and that's, and that's what I call growth hacking. And so growth hacking is really just about being able to look at the big picture and find opportunities to accelerate growth. So it's not just on the marketing side, but it's really all parts of the business. And then coming up with ideas for ways that you can improve how you acquire and convert companies or uh, customers, and then ultimately testing those ideas and, and analyzing if they work. And so as you continue that process, you get smarter and smarter about driving growth. While it's relatively new, it's actually based on something that's been around for hundreds of years, which is just the scientific method. So it's, it's really taking the same science that drug companies use to approve a new drug or any kind of inventor uses where they have a, a, a hypothesis and they test something and that ultimately we're just applying that test and learn process now to growth instead of to innovation. And so when we do that, we're able to drive a result over time. And so in the big picture, you want to be systematic and really use analysis as, you, as you're running that testing. But the, but the truth of it is that it really boils down to a really simple formula that the more testing you do, generally the more growth that you get. So all of that experimentation leads to learning, and every time you run an experiment, you get smarter about how to grow the business. And so what you're looking at here is the growth that Twitter had over a lot of years, and you can see that in 2000, late 2010, early 2011, Twitter started to flatten out in their growth. And so around 50 million users, they started to flatten out, but a new head of product came into the company and he said, you know, how many tests are we running? We have 50 million users on this product. Lots of people coming for the first time every day. How many tests are we running? And he realized they were only running about two tests per month. And he thought, you know, we need to run more tests than that. So he could have, he could have looked at the business and said, oh, we can, we can do better in how we acquire customers here or how we get people to use more often here. But he, he just said something really simple. He said, let's just focus on running 10 tests per week. And I'm confident if we run 10 tests per week, we're going to grow faster. And you can see as soon as they increased till 10 tests per week, their growth curve resumed and they, they grew for many years. And so it's not just Twitter that's done this. Company after company has used testing and experimentation to drive growth. In fact, one of the most valuable companies in the world, there's only, I think, three or four companies that are worth more than a trillion dollars. And Amazon is one of those companies. And this is a quote from the Amazon CEO, which is, our success at Amazon is a function of how many experiments we do per year, per month, per day. So this experimentation is ultimately what drives growth, what unlocks growth, what helps these companies make more and more impact on their customers. And so that's what growth hacking is all about. Now, it's not just randomly doing experiments, but again, in, in line with that scientific method, it's about having clear hypotheses of what you're trying to figure out when you run an experiment. Essentially, you have a guess. I think this is going to happen when we run this experiment. And then you run the experiment, and either that thing happens or it doesn't happen, and you learn something every time. And so when I say experiment, what am I talking about? That can be a little bit confusing. So. I'll give you just a few examples of some of the early experiments that we did at Dropbox when I was there. And so at Dropbox, it was essentially the, the screen that people spent the most time on was when you clicked on the taskbar, you get a drop down of your recently saved files. And so people wanted a shortcut to those files that they recently saved to Dropbox from any of their devices. And what we thought was, you know, a lot of these people are discovering Dropbox when they get a shared file from someone. So if someone shares a file with them, that's their first experience with Dropbox. Let's make it really easy to share files. So that would be our hypothesis is if we make it really easy to share files, 
people will share files more often and more people will get exposed to it. So we put this share link. When you hovered over a file, you'd get a share link where you'd be able to copy a direct link to that file. And then you can see the screen that comes up. We could have made it so that you actually had to sign up for Dropbox to get that file. Or the extreme opposite is we could have made it that you that you could just get the file and not even know it came from Dropbox. And so these are all tests that could be run over time. What worked best was to put a, a, a dialog box over the top of your file that says download and save, and, and save to your Dropbox by creating an account. And then if you didn't want to do that, you could just close that and see the file, but you see it in a wrapper that says Dropbox. And so that worked best there. So there's really a whole loop of tests that could be run just on this file sharing over time. And even this thing that says shared link, it could say share this file. There could be lots of different ways to say that. Um, we also added an upgrade link there so that you could get more space, but we could have tested get more space. So there's a lot of different tests on just getting people to spend money there. And then we inserted this layer that's kind of a promotional layer, right? This one's more of an educational one. So keep your photos safe by moving them to Dropbox. That's going to do two things. The more people put in their Dropbox, the more likely they're going to keep using Dropbox. But the other benefit is if they save their files to Dropbox, they're going to fill up their free version, and then they're likely going to upgrade to the premium version. So you can see just on one single screen, there's a lot of different tests. Obviously, a lot of different things could go into that promotional box as well. So that's, it's just getting into that mindset of there's a better way to do everything we're doing. Let's run lots and lots of tests. And so it turns out that every test you run, you're going to learn something. So even if, even if the test isn't successful, you learn that that didn't work. And so it's really about the more you repeat this process, you're going to get some things that, that are going to go into the box of, OK, these work, and these we can keep doing this more often, and it will drive better results. But even the ones that didn't work, you're going to get smarter about what does work and how you can grow the business. So as I mentioned before, it's not just about running lots of testing to drive up a growth curve, because we've all seen that before. So if you're just running lots of testing, for example, to drive registrations, and then that crashes, you didn't really create much value and impact in the world. So we don't want growth that crashes. We want growth that's sustainable over time. So what is it that drives sustainable growth? Turns out that value drives sustainable growth. If you don't get people to a valuable experience with your product, they're not going to keep using it. So first of all, you have to validate that you actually have a product that's valuable for anyone. So a lot of startups get stuck in just creating something that nobody cares about. But once you have validated that someone loves this product, then you need to understand what that experience is that makes it so that people love the product. And the more you can get new people into that experience and get existing people to experience it more often, the more that you'll be able to build sustainable growth that, that happens over time. And so one of the things that I learned from Facebook, and it's now very popular in Silicon Valley with most of the fast-growing companies, is that they came up with a metric for capturing this value. So this metric that represents value is the most important metric in the whole company for the companies that have identified it, and it's called a North Star metric. So it's really about looking at when new customers come in and get value, the metric grows. But if I get existing customers to get more value more often, the metric also grows. So it's about coming up with a metric that if you're focused on growing that metric, you'll drive sustainable growth over time. So that can get kind of confusing. So I'll give you some examples of what are some North Star metrics. So for companies like Uber and Lime, so the, the scooters that you can kind of rent and get around on or bikes they also have, it's all about trying to, to drive weekly rides. So in fact, the first head of growth at Uber um, was previously the head of international growth at Facebook. And the very first thing that he did when he joined Uber was sit down with the CEO of Uber and he said, we need to figure out a North Star metric. So something that everyone in the whole company has focused on growing, and that's where they came up with weekly rides. And so every day they're reporting how, how the weekly rides number is growing, and everyone in the company is focused on growing that because 
They know every time a ride happens, there's value for a rider. Somebody got where they needed to go, and there's also value for a driver. Somebody made some money when they got where they needed to go. So they could look at how many people downloaded the software or, you know, or the app, but those downloads often don't get used, so maybe there's not value that's happening, or maybe it gets used once and then never again, so there's not that much value that's created. But by focusing on rides, they really get a good indication of how much value is happening every time someone uh, takes an Uber. So for some other companies like uh, Slack and Facebook, they're focused on daily active users. So what they know is the more daily active users there are on Slack and on Facebook, the more people are getting value in those platforms. They're, they're really platforms for connecting people, so their value metric is gonna be how many active people are on those platforms. So again, everything they're doing in the business when they're running experiments, it's all about trying to grow their daily active user number. So some people might be saying, why wouldn't you just look at revenue? Revenue is a good number. It's actually a great number. The problem is that revenue is not always directly correlated with value being delivered. So if value and revenue are going together, then you're going to make the right decisions. But if you have a subscription-based software product, so like SaaS product, and people have bought an annual subscription and they stop using after one month, that's gonna look fine on the revenue. You, for the whole year, it looks like that revenue is strong, but for 11 months, those people didn't get any value. So if, as long as you're focusing on growing value, and you also, of course, wanna focus on revenue, but you wanna make sure that your revenue is not growing faster than your value, or it will cr crash eventually. And so. So that's why, that's why we use a value metric, a North Star metric, instead of revenue. Now, it's all about growing value. It's all about experimenting really quickly to grow that value. Now, where do you run those experiments? It looks like this. So we, we used to think of growth as really being more of just uh, the funnel, so kind of this acquisition and activation. But the truth is that there's, there's some kind of recurring loops that feed the North Star metric as well. So if I can get an existing user to use a lot more often, that's going to be an engagement loop that I'm trying to get people coming back more and more. If I can get existing users to bring in other users, that's a referral loop. Revenue is something that repeats, that feeds the whole engine. And all of this is working to drive your North Star metric. So. I want to show what this looks like for a specific company, and it's, it's a company I referenced already. It's called Acorns. And so Acorns is, uh, is a company that they, they originally set out to solve the problem of young people were not investing for their future very much. And so for whatever reason, and it's complex, they wanted to maybe w didn't want to sacrifice their current lifestyle. They didn't want to have to figure out, you know, where should I invest? And so that's the problem they went out to solve. And they wanted to make it really easy to do that investing. And so the way that Acorns works is that you sign up for the service. And then every time you use a credit card, if you spend, say, one euro and 20 cents, then 80 cents will go into your investment account. So it always rounds up to the closest dollar and you feed your investment account. So it it's really doesn't feel like you're investing much, but over time it adds up and, and you start investing quite a bit. So their North Star metric then is active investors. And you, what you can see is that that starts to align with their mission as well. So every time they get a new investor on the platform, they're helping to solve the problem that they went out to solve, was, which was to get young people to start investing more. And so they're all about trying to grow those active investors. Now, I could walk you through every single step in this value delivery engine for Acorns, but that would take too long, so I'm not going to do that. And it's pretty complex, but you can see there's a lot to growing this. And so it, it becomes really important for your business. You want to figure out not just what your North Star metric is, but what does that entire engine look like that drives your North Star metric? So, the referral loop is really powerful for these guys, for example. They have 557,000 App Store reviews. They're almost a five-star rating in the App Store. People love it. They make other people feel a lot safer. When you see 557,000 people who've reviewed it positively, you feel a lot safer putting your bank account information in there. 
Um, they know activation. They know what they need to do to get someone to use the product. They know what they need to do to get people coming back a lot. And then they can test to try to improve that. So this activation is something that most companies can get a big gain in their growth rate by just focusing on activation as a starting point. And so for Acorns, it's all about getting them to make their first investment in five minutes, so in less than five minutes. And so it's, it's pretty challenging when you think they have to not only sign up for the app, they have to download the app, sign up, and then also connect their credit cards, their bank account, and make their first investment all within five minutes. That's a, that's a big hurdle to cross, but they've done it. They've done it really effectively, and they now have seven million active investors on the platform. And uh, a couple of months ago, it was at five million active investors, so they're growing really fast. And uh, in fact, their VP of growth used to work with me um, at, at the company I sold last year, and she, uh, I interviewed her for um, my podcast. So if you want to snap a picture of that and actually hear how she's driving growth there, particularly running experiments inside a mobile app is a lot harder. So she shed some, some light on that, and uh, she's, she's super talented. So I, I recommend that. So, but the, the important thing to recognize for, um, for Acorns is that last slide where, that, I, that I mentioned is that that speed to value is so critical for driving growth. So before someone's tried your product, they're interested in it, but they're in that real danger zone of if this thing is complicated or complex, they're, they're likely to hit some kind of barrier. If their desire isn't really high and they hit any kind of friction, they're going to give up. So the faster you can get them to value, the more likely you're going to get them to a place where then you can focus on how do I retain them long term. And so speed to value is one of the critical things for today. So if I said some things that you should really focus on from, from this, one is sustainable growth is based on value. Speed to value is the fastest way to accelerate sustainable growth. Your North Star metric is how you measure it. And then focus a lot on experimentation. And so these are just some examples of other companies kind of speed to value. What's their activation metric? So for Facebook, they know if they acquire someone, if they only make one connection, that person didn't get very much value. If they make two connections, there's still a good chance they're going to lose that person. And so it's not really until they get to about seven connections. So after really analyzing the data, data and studying the data, at seven connections they learn that's when someone is likely to keep using Facebook in the long term. So everything they're doing for a new user is getting them to seven connections. So they're constantly putting people you might know in front of them. Once they have two connections, then they start to find the people they have in common. Do you know this person? Do you know that person? So trying to make additional money through advertising from those people at that point, it's kind of short-sighted. It's better to get them to the experience that they're long-term locked in so they can make advertising money for the next 10 years or longer. And so what they recognize is if they can't get them to seven friends in 10 days, then they're likely going to lose that person. So if it takes 20 days to get to seven friends, most people aren't going to wait that long. Uber, I already talked about. First ride, once you get in the car and you get somewhere, you got enough value that you understand Uber as a rider. And the same thing from the passengers or from the driver's side. Once you've taken a passenger somewhere and they, they uh, credit some money in your account, then you're feeling like, okay, Uber's, Uber's valuable. I'm going to keep using it. Um, for Slack, how many, how many people know Slack here, familiar with the company? Okay, good. So for Slack, it's amazing because most of you probably have never seen a Slack advertisement, but you all know what it is, and it's because it's all through invites and word of mouth. It's, it's grown really quickly to a multi, multi-billion dollar company, and one of the things they figured out pretty quickly was that companies that don't get to 2,000 messages almost always cancel. Once they get to 2,000 messages inside Slack, they have about a 96% retention rate. So everything Slack's doing when they get a new company using Slack is trying to get them to that 2,000 messages. So how do we increase the number of invites that are going out? How do we make it so people respond faster with the right, with the right prompts when they get a message? All of those help to feed that 2,000 number. The challenge with all of this experimentation that I'm talking about, it's not just marketing. So if, 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 if this presentation was on, you should 
use testing and data in marketing, everyone would say, yeah, that's, that's how marketing's been done for years. That's the right way to do online marketing. The challenge is, I'm talking about these activation numbers and how to build engagement loops in the business and how to drive referral and what's the right revenue model. And when you start talking about all of those things, now you're talking about getting people across different teams in the company trying to work together on this experimentation, and that's what's really hard. So that journey crosses multiple teams. Most of those teams are not used to this kind of test, test learn process, and so that's where you can expect to hit some challenges. So I'll just give you, I'm not gonna go into all the things you can do to overcome those challenges because we don't have that much time, but here's the, here's the best thing that you can do. And Mark Zuckerberg, surprisingly, um, I, I knew that, that Facebook was really kind of the pioneers on the growth team and pioneers on this concept of North Star metric, but I still, with those two concepts, saw most companies getting stuck with growth hacking and, and not able to effectively keep it going, and so, I started doing research. I, I thought, you know, it's this cross-functional challenge that stops companies. I'm going to try to find how do you overcome the cross-functional friction to this testing? Who, who are the management philosophy people behind cross-functional? And then I find this article that the surprising management genius Mark Zuckerberg has figured out cross-functional and really it pointed to these three things. So having a team that is designed to work cross-functionally, that's the idea of a growth team that's really focused on growing that North Star metric and keeping the company running a high velocity of experiments, and then having that North Star metric being something that aligns with the mission of the business, and everyone knows that's the key success metric in the business. And then the third thing that I got from the article was just this, this importance of mission. And if, if you had asked me before, I would say, Mission is something they teach in an MBA course, so I'm gonna write a mission statement, it's kinda boring, but the, the truth is that mission is purpose. Mission is what, what are we trying to accomplish in this business? Why is this business important? It's the one thing that if you've got a marketing team, a sales team, a product team, it's probably the one thing that everyone should be able to agree on. Why are we doing something important? And if you can articulate what that mission is and get people focused on that mission and the metric is tied to that mission and the growth team and everyone is really focused on growing that metric, you can start to drive that alignment that leads to, to breakout results. So what they said with Zuckerberg is that he's, he finds a way to get mission into every conversation that he has inside and outside the company. He's mind-numbingly efficient about getting it into every conversation a couple of times. And so bring the world closer together is what they're trying to do. And then growing the daily active user number is, is the success metric that shows they're making progress on that. So where do you start? You've, just, you've learned a lot here. Um, so where, where do you start with all of this? This is the framework that I like to use to figure out where to start. Level one is basically you cannot grow sustainably if you don't deliver value. Product market fit essentially means you've created something that's really valuable for at least somebody. Hopefully the market and product market fit is big enough that you, you can create something that's really meaningful as a company, but it, it means that your product fits for the market. So, once you've validated that you have product market fit, people keep using your product. If you're, another way to look at it is something called product market fit survey, which is a free survey I have online that you can kind of get a leading indicator on there, some directions on how to use it. Um, but once you've validated you have product market fit, then you can talk about what is our North Star metric. It's gonna be a function of the value that you realize in product market fit. You like build in the rest of the, the tracking systems then you can start experimenting. You can't experiment if you don't have the right tracking systems in place, so that's what that level two is. But once you start experimenting, that's where a growth team starts to make sense, having kind of a weekly meeting of testing and learning and keeping track of what you're learning, and then you work to be able to test across all levers and then ultimately trying to build this company-wide mindset and culture of growth, which is what you see in the fastest growing companies. So, that gives you a, a good overview of how to get started with growth hacking. These are the key takeaways I recommend for you. So value drives sustainable growth. Be focused on expanding value and you'll be able to keep that growth going up, to, up and to the right. The growth hacking process is about testing and learning very quickly on how you accelerate growth. Apply the growth hacking process across all parts of the customer journey. 
and then shared mission is going to help you overcome that biggest hurdle, which is getting these cross-functional teams to work together. If you're an early stage startup, it's way easier. The bigger you are and the longer you've been around as a company, the more you're going to have to fight the friction of getting teams to work well together. So we hopefully have some time for some questions. Thank you. How do you gain trust from leadership to bold experiments? Uh, don't say to gain trust with little experiments. They don't sign on bold ones. Yeah, I think, um, I think what you have to do for, for leadership is that they, you, you need to, you, they need to understand the big picture importance of, of this is how companies drive success today. And it's, I mean, give them a copy of my book might be a good start, but I, I think that ultimately, um, ultimately that's, this, this is the way that companies are successful today, and, and if, they don't, if they don't understand that, then it's, it's going to be a lot harder to convince them that this is exactly how to do it and how to get started with it. And so um, I, that, that would be my recommendation is, is uh, the, the starting point of being, you know, maybe it's a direct competitor that you point to that these guys are committed to testing and learning, and, um, and, then, and then from there you can start to worry about how. Cool. Uh, you talked a lot about growth hacking for B2C. Could you please comment a bit more on B2B industry, where sales cycles are super low, super slow, uh, uh, as well as time to value? Yeah, so, well, B2B obviously is a, is a pretty broad category. The Slack example I gave is B2B, but how they grow is much more in a consumer way. You have other companies that might have one-year sales cycles and, and very big enterprise customers. Um, I, I would say where this probably applies the most in that later ladder example would be once you make the sale, being able, you know, depending on the product, but I, I just interviewed on my podcast the chief marketing officer for a company called Trip Actions, and they went from kind of zero to four billion dollar valuation in four years and selling to primarily the biggest, uh, biggest enterprises out there. And she was really focused on, um, th one of the huge drivers for that is that they, they essentially have a solution that is just so much better for the actual, it's a corporate travel solution, so it's so much better for the actual travelers inside the corporation that the, the pitch has gotten very strong. So it's kind of more of a traditional approach to the channels themselves. So they're, they're going to trade shows and, and different conferences and you know, building brand and, and you know, talking with influencers and all of that, but it's, it's being, able to, being able to make that argument that all of the legacy players, so what are people already doing? Most of them are on these platforms that were around for 30 or 40 years and trip actions was built for you know from the ground up as a mobile first business and so mobile is is what you need when you're traveling and so being able to kind of stress what the end user value proposition is and not over indexing on the on the buyer persona which is what a lot of I think B2B people do so when you look at the end user piece even though their transaction size is big and their sales cycle might be big. It's that end user value proposition and really iterating with this test learn process on, on creating a lot more value for the end users, which has become their competitive advantage, which is why they've been able to grow so quickly. Okay. Who is your favorite MB uh, player? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Uh, question from Igor. What's some macro experiments you have found useful in the early stage startups? Some macro experiments? Yeah, macro. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to me, the, um, in the really early stages of a startup, it's about trying to, trying to get that value proposition right. And so I, I think you know, one of the mistakes that the challenge early stage is obviously to get enough people to get a big enough sample size to actually know if a test is successful. So what you should not do in the early stages is very little headline tests and button color tests and little tests because that's going to require tens of thousands or, or you know, millions of users potentially to get a kind of statistically significant result on it. So do big, bold tests where you're com trying completely different positioning and layout on, on pages. I, I um, was reading in the last couple of days about an icon test that, uh, that someone ran that, that 
just, just the app icon for a game being a, a massive difference, like, like made the difference in, in how quickly that business was growing. That's a pretty easy test to run, but it's every single person is seeing that as kind of the main image of the, of the game. So I think uh, just think very big, bold tests. How do you understand uh, and tell others when it's enough to iterate on the experiment and it's time to kill it? So, it, it, obviously there's kind of statistical significance that tells you if it's, if it's time to kill it or not. Um, we, we, I just talked a little bit about if you're, if you're really having a hard time getting to statistical significance, it's probably because you're too minor on the experiments that you're running. I, I think the kill versus keep going question is more usually around an opportunity that you're trying to drive improvement. So um, an example that I like to share is at, at uh, Log Me In, we found a channel that sent 200,000 people a day through this channel for two cents each. So a super cheap channel that brought them in. And there was actually a 10% sign up rate from that channel. So it looked like this is going to be great. 20,000 people a day signing up, well within our expected sign up cost. But then at the download step, 90% drop off. So 90% of the people get dropped out of the funnel after signing up when they got to the download step. And so initially we went in and just ran lots of tests there. Lots of just, you know, maybe they don't see the button. Let's make it bigger. <laughs> you know, you run out of screen space eventually and let's, let's make it clear this thing's free. And so we ran probably 10 or 12 tests, and none of them succeeded. So that would be a time where I think a lot of people would have said, OK, let's move on. Maybe this just isn't going to work for us. But we said, you know, we have 18,000 people a day who are signing up and giving us their email. Let's ask them, why are you signing up and not downloading the software? And we didn't have a really clever survey or anything. We just, we just kind of automated a message out to them that said, you know, look like it came from customer success that just said, hey, notice you signed up and, and didn't use what happened. And we got a bunch of people saying, I just didn't believe it was free. And so now we were solving for a known problem. Our next test gave us a 300% increase in the download rate. And it was simply giving them a choice, download the free version or download the paid version. And we put a big check mark on the free version, but now they believed we had a free version when they saw we also had a paid version. So that's, it's really hard to know when to give up, but that's an example of when it would have been easy to give up, but we, we made a, a channel really impactful and big for us by not giving up. Okay, uh, Dropbox referrals thing. What is the result of constructive experiments? Uh, was it a it a result of constructive experiments or a sudden success? So I think it's, it's partly, for, for the Dropbox um, referral program, it's partly understanding what was already working in the business. So before we incentivize referrals, we had a really high referral rate. And, and it wasn't just because people were sharing a file and getting exposed or you know, it getting invited to a collaboration folder. It was mostly the biggest driver was people who loved the product who were telling other people about it. And so when you already have that, it's not that hard to double down on it and accelerate it more. So we built the program. We tested different prompts on how to promote the program. Like one of the things that worked really well was, you know, I, I, have, I have, for example, um, Tesla has a referral program, and I have a friend who, who uh, use my referral code for buying a Tesla, and I never got anything that said he used my referral code. They just added some free charging for me. And so that's not a good example, and, and not surprisingly, they've killed their referral program because it didn't work very well. So one of the things we did with Dropbox was every time someone you referred, even if you didn't sign up for the program and you just shared a file with them and they signed up, we would give you a notification that said, Someone just signed up, you got some free space, and that became the trigger to get other people to sign up. So there's, it, it's not the whole program, it's, it's kind of lots of little touch points that made the program work. Yeah, for anyone who didn't hear the question, he, he was asking, was it easy for leadership to sign on? So first of all, there was eight people when I was there, so leadership was me talking to Drew across the table, and, and so um, it wasn't like lots of layers, but it was, it was literally um, 
calculating a customer acquisition cost, if we went out, how much could we pay to acquire someone? How much, uh, initially it was 250 megabytes of free space. How much does 250 megabytes cost us? That's way cheaper than, than what we would normally be paying through a paid channel. So yeah, it was, it was very easy. Do you think growth hacking could be applied to gambling or lottery businesses where value for the user is just the belief to win? What could be the North Star metric? Thanks. Well, probably North Star metric there is money. So sometimes, <laughs> sometimes money does uh, end up being a North Star metric. But um, yes, I, I do. In fact, um, one, I, you know, one of the things I didn't get into on here that you, uh, you might have seen up on the screen was this idea of the engagement loop. And um, I highly recommend a book by, book by Neary All called Hooked. And it's, it's all about use, how, how do you optimize an engagement loop. And one of the key components of that is a variable reward. And so it's the idea that if you had a predictable reward every time, that is not as exciting. The reason that email is something that you have to keep checking is because it's, it's actually a variable reward. You almost always have email when you check. Most of the time, it's neutral. Every once in a while, it's a really positive email. It's that one client who finally got back to me or that one prospect or on the other side, we just, I got a notification that we just lost our most important customer or something like that. that that excitement is the same excitement you get when you're gambling and, and you know, pulling a slot machine. And, you know, the, the fact, I, 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 uh, it, it's kind of interesting. I, when I interviewed um, the Gila from Acorns, we were talking about all of their growth happened at the time when the stock market has been really, um, really strong in the United States. And so what would happen if the stock market was going down? Would a lot of these people not want to invest? And, you know, all you have to do is look at Las Vegas where most people lose money, but people keep pouring lots of money in there because of this, this variable reward component. So I, I do think it, it works there. You have to, I think Las Vegas has, has, has kind of figured out that it's the, it's the excitement, it's the thrill that someone's, re reason that someone signs up. It's not necessarily just to earn money from it. And so it's, you have to kind of figure out what is, the, what is the emotion that you're selling into, the benefit that you're selling into might not always be obvious. Okay, and the last question from Slido. Uh, when you raise hypothesis and run A-B test, what percentage of, uh, of growth is meaningful to, m to make a change? Two, five, ten or more persons, I guess. Persons. Well, it depends. How big are you? If you're Facebook, 0 0.001 is probably worth tens of millions of dollars for, for most of us. You know, I, I, th I think it's one of those things that anything that's an improvement is worth keeping and so you know we're you're you're making lots of these improvements that add up over time but the truth is that every time you're running experiments you're you're kind of pulling the the slot machine kind of hoping for the jackpot because occasionally there are experiments that do give you that 10x or 100x accelerant and you have to get lots of little wins, but why would you not take a little win if, you, if you've got it? And so it's really, does that, is that little win still in the margin of error on the experiment, in which case you, it's, you didn't run it long enough to be able to, to, be able to say it's a winner, but if it's, if it's you know, a statistically significant win, then it's worth keeping. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to repeat it because in the back they probably didn't hear you. So what, what is the value of outsourcing growth hacking? Um, you know, I, I think that the, I, I, I think that outsourcing marketing makes a lot of sense. Like top, top not completely outsourcing, but, but w having the help of an agency when, you know, somebody's going to have really deep expertise on Facebook maybe and, and, and uh, Google and, you know, these evolving platforms. If you can tap into that knowledge, that can be really valuable. But as I talked about, the biggest barrier to adoption here is running experiments that are deeper in that customer experience. And it's, it's really hard to do when you're full time inside the company to convince those other teams to do that. So I just can't imagine how, how an external agency could help to drive that type of adoption.
what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of people are very annoyed that, um, that you, know, you have a lot of people who've never done anything who just go and update their LinkedIn profile to say growth hacker. And um, I don't find that annoying, mostly because I think, I think that growth, you know, the reason I came up with the term growth hacking was when I was leaving Dropbox, I, most of my income in working with Dropbox came from equity that I had, came from you know, having a company become worth billions of dollars and so that little bit of stock. So I wanted to have, I wanted to have the person who took over growth approach it in a way that I thought they could be really effective. And the problem was almost every resume I got was, was you know, we're gonna, I, I'm really good at branding and positioning and, and you know, building awareness. And, you know, and it's not to say that those things don't matter, but when a company is eight or 10 people, you, you have to be focused on experiences. How do, how do I get new people to experience the product in a way that costs less then they're worth to us and that those experiences get other people and you've got you've to be like kind of more results driven and that to me that's what, what growth hacking is and, and you know later stage when you then add some awareness and branding and some other things it can, it can be an accelerant on a lot of those things and so I think that's the benefit of, of the term gaining a lot of popularity is at least it gets conversation going. Is it bullshit? Is it not bullshit? what, you know, that's just marketing done the right way. And that's okay. Like, I mean, I think, I think the dialogue leads people to find a better truth than maybe what they had before. So it, it doesn't bother me at all. And maybe last question before a short break. Yeah, I didn't. I just interviewed <laughs> them. I think I think they they prompt it quite a bit, but I think part of it is it's just it's such a a great solution. And and when you they have seven million people and five hundred and sixty two thousand reviews, so less than ten percent of the people review the product. And um, but a, a lot of it is is just prompting people to to review us in the app store. And in fact, that that tends to bring your average rating up when you do that because otherwise the people who review you are usually the ones who are who are upset <laughs> so um, being able to get people who are actively using and giving them the prompt to do that it, it's it's a good thing but I, I think I think it's directly a, a function of passionate customers on the product and um, having passionate customers on the product is a function of having a team that's really obsessed on how do I get people within five minutes to actually make that first investment and overcome all of those hurdles and, and constantly run experiments to, to shorten that first investment time? So I, I think it's more a function of just being really good at the overall value delivery growth engine. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started, and uh, we'll, we'll assume people will f file in and grab their seats. Uh, so... Um, I'm, I'm excited to kick off this panel. In fact, I'm, I'm actually recording this panel for my podcast. So it's, uh, it's I, I kind of ran into a situation where I knew I was going to be here this week and I have to release a podcast episode every week. And so I was really excited when I could kind of kill two birds with one stone and actually do, do a podcast episode as well. But um, to a little bit of context on what brought me here was that... Um, I, I came yesterday to spend time with Tessonet and um, to really work with the team on, on growth hacking and, and trying to adopt the, a lot of the processes that we just talked about in the, um, in the last presentation. So um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity from the uh, Tessonet team to be able to, to be here and had, had a good time really connecting with the team and uh, helping a company that's already had a, a huge amount of success look for opportunities to further accelerate that success. So Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. 
So we'll, we'll see if, uh, if, if, the, uh, if, if the workshop actually does that or not. So I'm, I'm sure I'll get an angry note if it doesn't. We promise you that. <laughs> Perfect. So why don't we start and we'll just actually go in, in this direction on the introduction. So the, the idea here is that um, we're going to talk about a lot of what we just covered there, but, but how it applies directly in some really successful companies and... Uh, and um, we'll also look at, J JB will give us some feedback on sort of on the B2B. I know there were some questions around that as well, but I'll, I'll start with an introduction. Um, so uh, Jonas, uh, you can help me with the last name on how you pronounce your last name. It uh, doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> it didn't look like it says doesn't matter, but I guess that's... Uh, <laughs> Jonas Kerklis. Okay, there we go. I thought that was special Lithuanian pronunciation. So he's the uh, co-founder of Tessonet, and um, if you didn't know it already, they're, they're a really successful company here, and uh, I'm excited to uh, welcome him, and if you could give us a brief introduction to Tessanet, what you guys do. Yeah, so Tessanet once uh, was a small startup, and now it's a big startup. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, we, Tessanet is an accelerator for different products and projects, and Tessanet invests money in other startups and companies. And uh, yeah, uh, the company is now quite big and uh, we have almost 1,000 people right now. Um, yeah, and uh, one of the focus of, of uh, areas uh, is cybersecurity. Yeah, so pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, and then to Jonas's uh, left, we've got, yeah, I'm going to need some help on your last name as well. So J.B. Dagane. Yeah, okay. <laughs> how, how do you pronounce it? Dagane. There we go. So <laughs> I'm not even going to try. So um, J.B. is from France, uh, but he's, he's based here uh, with a company called Zev 70 Ventures, which is a revenue accelerator for B2B startups. So welcome, J.B. Do you want to give us a little more of an explanation of what you're doing? Sure. Uh, so glad to be here. The, the long story short is I'm a sales guy. Eventually I became an entrepreneur and today I'm an investor. And the short story of what I do is uh, I start my day by eating SaaS for breakfast and I have B2B sales for lunch and I finish <laughs> it with data for dinner. <laughs> and um, and e eventually how we help startups from the very beginning, we help founders to repeat what they have been successful at and uh, putting them in front of customers with a specialized sales team that will basically look for leads the same way the founders would look for them and book meetings for them. So they, uh, early on, the founders only spend time on the part of the B2B sales process that add value. And it was very interesting to look at how you do growth hacking because we do tons of testings and we value data over opinions 100 times. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a yeah. key component of growth hacking. Opinions are not worth very much. Yep. <laughs> Opinions are hypotheses. Yes. So, uh, and then we have next to JB, we have Thomas Slimas. Did I probably Slimas? Okay. <laughs> Hopefully uh, you, you guys will all, all know that I'm butchering that because he's the, uh, uh, the second Lithuanian on the, on the panel here. So uh, Thomas is the CMO and co-founder of Oberlo, a company that was founded here in Lithuania and pretty quickly got acquired by Shopify, so congratulations on that. That is awesome, and so now he's also a director of online marketing at Shopify, so welcome. Can you give us a brief introduction to what you guys do at Oberlo and the problem you solve? Sure, uh, glad to be here. Um, so um, Oberlo is now part of Shopify, and together with Shopify, uh, we help uh, entrepreneurs start their businesses and grow them, uh, and we support them throughout their journey. Um, okay. <laughs> All right, and then finally we've got uh, Thomas Platenga. Almost. Uh, <laughs> almost. All right. Um, so he's the CEO of Vinted, and I'm really excited to have Thomas up here because I think there's a really unique story in, in Vinted. Um, it's uh, a company that was founded here in Lithuania, and it's uh, unicorn status. So there's uh, there's that, that, that's a hard status to get to, but I think what's particularly interesting is that Thomas came in as part of a, a turnaround effort there, and so to, to be able to help drive a turnaround to build a unicorn company, I don't care what country you're in, I have not heard about that, so that, that is super exciting. Can you give us a little bit more details on what Vinted is all about? Yeah, well, Vinted is uh, pretty simple. We, uh, we sell second-hand clothes, so we really know well how to sell your clothes, and that's about it. 
I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, we can talk about uh, all kinds of stuff, but practically that's what we do well. And since 2016, we kind of found out how to do it. Because before that, it was like a really nice idea and people loved it. But then we found the economical model on how to make it a scalable business. Fantastic. Well, um, we will definitely dig more into that story as we go on. But I wanted to start by just you know, looking at it from, from the local angle here. Um, there's, there's some huge advantages to being based in Lithuania, um, but there, I'm sure there's some challenges as well, especially relative to being in, say, Silicon Valley, where there's a big network for startups. Um, I'd, I'd love to get some of your thoughts on, uh, and I won't have much to contribute here since I've not been based here, but some of your thoughts on sort of the advantages and disadvantages of being based here in, in Vilnius. Anyone want to take first shot at it? Let's try. Right. Uh, so, of course, it depends, you know, on area, I, I think, because if you want to start business in, uh, and to have basketball business, uh, probably, you know, it's <laughs> the best place on earth. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, if you want to achieve something in soccer, it could be a bit difficult. <laughs> but being more serious, um, actually, I, I, you know, I never thought about, you know, pros and cons being based in Lithuania because, you know, we are all Lithuanians and just started business here. But um, uh, the most important thing, I, th uh, I believe, is uh, people because, you know, we have so many great, talented, you know, curious, uh, hardworking people. Uh, so it's actually the best place to be. Uh, of course, uh, our market uh, is quite limited because you know we have fewer than three million people, and if you take into consideration kids and elder people, it's even more fewer. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, so, uh, but yeah, and uh, maybe you know if you need uh, some money uh, or you think about venture capital. Or and uh, trendy venture ca capital companies, it could be quite difficult because uh, it's not a secret that, you know, not everyone uh, knows Lithuania uh, because probably we need more unicorns, not only one. <laughs> um, yeah, so my thoughts. So what about, you know, you mentioned that there's a three million-ish population here that, that probably most companies that would start here would be looking externally right from the beginning. That, that maybe would be a bit of an advantage. Would you agree? I don't know. I think um, it sounds small, three million, but on the other hand, it's big enough. You know, uh, you got a thousand people. So, you know, in, in the bigger context of things, Riga is around the corner. Uh, people are easily moving around through the Baltics or from Poland to here. I, I don't see it that much as, an, as a constraint. I meant more as as a target consumers outside of Lithuania. Yeah, so 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 consumers don't try to search them in Lithuania because yeah. like it's, it doesn't make sense at all. I mean, it's it's so small. Yeah. Like you'll just like you're gonna make a product with a language that is difficult as difficult as Chinese, and then you have a target population that that, that is so small. No, <laughs> so so to definitely build something that is scalable around Europe, uh, mm -hmm. U.S. or whatever it is. I mean, I think I think that's one of the beautiful things. You know, both of you guys have, have done here. Um, but in terms of, of people, it's, it's absolutely an advantage to be here. Okay. I mean, they're, 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 the population is very well educated. People are working really hard. They're not just working for money, but they want to show that they can make something from here, which is a, a different driver emotionally that, that makes people do things that they will never do when they're from Berlin or from London or from San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, just, just to a point where we were at a company firing half of the company. The other people that stayed, they actually stayed. I mean, try to do that in Berlin. You're saying like, well, you know, guys, our revenue is declining. The rest of the money that we left over, we're going to burn on television and we're mm. going to cut out <laughs> half of all the revenue streams. And we would love you to stay over for a couple more months to see if it's going to work. Like in Berlin, everybody would be out of the door the next day. Right. Right? Here in Lithuania, people were like, hell yes, let's give it a try. You know, and, and that's, that's an attitude that comes from uh, having a driver to build businesses here that is more than to make money. Mm -hmm. And I felt enormously attracted to that. I felt at home in that. And, and it, it makes teams do here things that I've not seen them do in Berlin or in New York. And mm -hmm. I, th I think that's a massive advantage that we have here. Awesome. I love that. 
I could uh, I could second that. I, I, I do agree with what Jonas and Thomas said. Um, I would just add the nuance here is that uh, due to the lack of optionality in this market, because it is very small, mm -hmm. uh, people have less experience in 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 in, in their kind of uh, disciplines. And uh, due to that, they are more loyal because they have less uh, optionality. Um, uh, not only more loyal, but they are also more excited about opportunities because there is less optionality. And then they require from the company a little bit more kind of guidance, education, et cetera. So that creates all of this kind of uh, environment where uh, companies invest in people, like Testnet invests heavily in people, we invest heavily in people, Vinted has, has invested heavily in people. And you invest a lot in people because they bring less uh, experience and but that in turn brings more loyalty and i think that's mm -hmm. a very good dynamic uh, whereas in berlin the relationship is very much transactional because mm -hmm. you can get employed at any other company next month mm -hmm. uh, but also they can bring some uh, some some good power um, i guess where uh, the disadvantage of lithuania is, is 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 the english language uh, where like in order to sell to outside of Lithuania, which we all do, uh, you need to tell the story really well mm -hmm. um, for your ads, for your creative, for your sales message. And if you uh, if you don't uh, if you don't you know uh, kind of if you haven't employed the craft of English language well, and and you can't sell, then I think that will be a problem. So I think yeah. that's kind of a big disadvantage, and that's the reason why many of us employ marketing teams in Berlin, for example. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean. But, but if you think of it, like the difficulties of localization uh, is, is way smaller than the difficulties of building an actual company and a product. Right. So building your actual product here with people here and then fine tuning the, the comms and marketing from Berlin, I think it's actually a fantastic combination that is easily done. Right. And, that's, and, and some of that is, is pretty easy to outsource on the, on the kind of communications and, and marketing side of things where most of the rest of the stuff is pretty hard to outsource. <laughs> Anything you'd add, JB? No, definitely. And I mean, I'm, I'm super glad to hear a lot of stuff I can relate to about, you know, the people and the energy you get there. And, and I mean, I've, I've lived and worked in, in the UK, in Denmark, and also in France. And I mean, you talk about English level. I mean, have you worked with French people before? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you guys no, are no doing comments. great. <laughs> um, but, like, Back six years ago, or maybe almost seven years ago, when I started to interact with the ecosystem here, uh, there was just the first VC coming to town. So the ecosystem was just blooming, just mm -hmm. getting started. And I remember bringing my friends here to talk at uh, Login and to do some workshop from Copenhagen, from like the B2B SaaS scene. And they were like, this is great. I mean, almost telling me that this is cute, what we are doing here. <laughs> <laughs> and that we are like, oh, five, six, maybe seven years behind. And I was like, we don't have time. To, we don't have seven years yeah, to catch yeah. up and like what's the options and then of course we could expand and, and many companies were doing this opening in London and so on but also many companies decided to invest back in the talent scene mm -hmm. and I think uh, what all the ecosystem have invested we got it ten times back and we are definitely ahead in now in some kind of niche uh, comparing to, to the competition especially if you look at fintech uh, I think a lot of effort were put in this direction and we have some great fintech companies uh, but then also I'd like to say that uh, when it comes to um, product and, and you know building uh, technology here, like we are definitely the underdogs. Like no one expects you, mm -hmm. but then you know you can kind of get beaten in the ass, and that was Lithuania. Right. Awesome. <laughs> so, so Thomas, when you uh, when you came to Lithuania, did you know much about Lithuania before you before you decided to be part of this turnaround? No. First, I confused it with Latvia. <laughs> painful. So I was very ignorant and um, uh, they booked me, I came at night in this uh, super, they booked me in this super old congress hotel or something like that where like the carpets are red and the carpets go up to the wall. Oh, that's and that's I, the place I, they put me actually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, well, yeah. <laughs> so, so I came in at night from New York and I'm like getting into this, out of a cab into this, I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be Soviet all the way. So. So and then the next morning I woke up and there was like elderly people having breakfast. It was like a German elderly tourist <laughs> tour or something in my hotel. I was like, oh, wow. But then I walked out and I saw it's actually a beautiful city. Then I met the guys and, and that's where, you know, I met the people at, at Vinted and I saw with how much passion they were working. And I don't know, it didn't, didn't matter anymore, you know? Right, so, right. So, so it's, it's all, it was all different than I expected. And... Uh, you know, I stayed because I love it. So, you right. know, very quickly I realized it was a great place to do business and to live, actually. So, 
Wow. So um, let's let's dig in a little bit more to what you actually did because that, again, that was I was I was so excited when I saw I was going to be on the panel with you, given given that story. So. You know, what, what, what was the problem that was holding back growth and what were some of the key things that you guys did to, to turn things around? Yeah, so I, I think uh, I, I came in at the beginning of your talk and um, I, a couple of key points that you laid out were exactly missing. And um, one of the elements that you said, uh, for example, what is the value that you deliver to customers? So the first thing that we did is I mapped out, okay, what's our value proposition towards customers? So we looked at, okay, um, what are we doing? We're selling clothes. Okay, where can you sell your clothes? Okay, let's look. Uh, eBay, Kleinanzeigen, uh, Le Bon Coin, da, da 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 We put down all the propositions, looked at what their offer was. Then we did tests, like how fast you sell clothes there. And it practically became super clear. Like we were the most expensive and you sold your clothes the slowest, <laughs> if you were even lucky to, to sell it. Right. And so, so that was the first thing, like, okay, our value proposition is not on par with the rest. So how do we add more value? Well, we need to make become the cheapest and we need to sell the fastest. Mm -hmm. Okay, sell the fastest, that means our sell-through rate needs to be within a certain point. So you looked at what our success metrics, well, Northern Star is unique sellers. So we need to build the biggest community with unique sellers. How do we do that? By making the time to sell as fast as possible. So we need to reach a certain sell-through rate within certain days. And to be very honest, that was actually it. Mm -hmm. so, so it was really driven from how do we give value to people, when do they are happy with us, and how do we reach as fast as possible, wow. and then just turning every arrow in your company towards that. Right. And it, practically Amazing. that's what we did. That's fantastic. It's uh, so, so cool to actually follow on from what I was just talking about and, and hear kind of, I mean, talk about things being a, a before and after test. So, so much of my experience was sort of, customer zero opportunities where I went in, you know, with Dropbox, there was eight people when I was there and, you know, customer zero, it logged me in and uproar. And so I didn't really have that contrast of the before and after in doing a lot of these things. So it's, just, it's amazing to hear when you went in and, and just added this, that it made that big of a difference. And of course, I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of operational things and other things that you brought to the table, but that's... And I think, like, constantly, still even now, I think, even now when things are going well, you need to constantly ask yourself, what is the value that we actually add? Are we not getting outpaced? And, and one of the elements that we figured out later is, like, hey, we can play with the shipping pricing, for example, as well. And we brought, again, another growth loop into the game, like, hey, we're not just a UX marketplace, we actually are the full funnel of this. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think if we, if we look at where our marketplace is moving, and I think you can even tell more about that, is like actually we, we went from being marketplace that was practically a front with a certain product that made you sell, and now we see that actually the verticalization into shipping, payments, customer support, trust and safety products, mm -hmm. really finding in each of these elements growth loops and verticalizing and building businesses within that is every time when you practically need to apply these growth hacking tactics that you're, you, you, you're, you talked about today, because each of these elements are actually business within your ecosystem. Uh, yeah. and, and, and we're going from, let's say, where tech companies were just a tech surface supplying some kind of element to becoming like full service companies that, mm -hmm. that really own all these parts. So, so I think even along the way, not in the beginning, it stays relevant to test yourself towards these things. Yeah, I think people miss that so often with growth that they, they assume it's just about getting more customers, but if you mess up those touch points, those operational touch points throughout the business, you can't keep the customers, you, you just, you're not gonna be able to drive sustainable growth. Look, look if, if you think of that, right? So if you, are, if you are constantly just focusing on let's, how can I get a better conversion rate to lister or to buyer or whatever, and, that, and you think that's your job, you know, that's not what Jeff Bezos did when he built, uh, built his marketplace. He was selling books and he ended up with a Kindle, right? Yeah. So, so you need to think like, where's going books next? It's right, not about right. just the conversion rate. It's about really understanding the whole element of reading books. Like, how can we do that better? How can we service all these elements in there? Right. And I I, I, so, so, yeah. Awesome. Well, I have to set the record straight on something. Uh, the hotel that they put me up is one of the nicest hotels I've ever been in, so I'm not in the same place. So <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will transition to Jonas now. So tell us a little bit on, on Tessonet. I mean, it, it, to, to be pushing 1,000 employees <laughs> now, what, what did you guys, like, what, why did you even decide to start the company, and, and what, what were some of the, th the important things you did in the beginning that put you on that kind of a trajectory? 
Yeah, so, you know, at the beginning we were, we were thinking about global warming, uh, poverty, uh, you know, huge scale of conflicts, uh, wars, and uh, the lack of education. Uh, but actually, no, you know, <laughs> we were always driven and we are still driven by, you know, curiosity uh, to, do, to do something online, you know, to create a uh, new business, uh, uh, to, to try to generate, you know, some traction to, to those projects and, you know, we we are you know growth hackers from the very beginning uh you know so no, nothing special i believe you know just you know uh inside you know something something inside and, yeah uh, well so I'm, I'm hearing this kind of theme of curiosity come up a, a couple of times do you think that's that's something that's pretty natural to the lithuanian culture is is having curiosity or just people in general what do you what do you think gb <laughs> Actually, we have uh, seven values that we check when we hire talent, and one of them is curiosity. Okay. Yeah, and we hired 100 people in 10 months. Uh, Here in Lithuania, yeah. so so there, so there was at least 100 people yeah. who had it. <laughs> and what was the, uh, did, did you have to talk to 10 to find one that fit? Or? I actually, I'm not in charge of that part. Okay, <laughs> you, you assume. <laughs> no, no, but, but I, I still believe, yes, of course, there is a lot of curiosity in the market, but now we also say that sometimes, and uh, I would say people are naive, but in a good way, like, uh, of, you know, trying and not being afraid to fail at, 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 at stuff they want to experiment. Mm -hmm. And I guess also, like, working with the first or the second generations that is looking west and not east uh, uh -huh. here is uh, kind of driving and fueling this curiosity mm -hmm. that even if you are the first company selling, you know, secondhand uh, online in Lithuania, uh, you will be the first to do this from Lithuania. Right. Like uh, selling whatever product online or whatever, and that just creates a lot of drive that is linked to curiosity. Of, well, and, and that's, I think it's really great. Well, that, that is great. So let's, why don't we transition to sort of your, your expertise uh, in, in the B2B side of things. Uh, when, you, when you look at so, so what you just heard about Vinted there and some of the things I talked about, um, it was more, more B2C focus. What do you think are some of the biggest differences in, in B2B that people who are focused on B2B should be fo looking at? I mean, it's just that in the type of B2B business where I work, we have a much more, so like you said, with Dropbox and Slack, it's very close to consumer with the self-service experience where it's heavy on, on the UX and the marketing side of it, on the product marketing, I guess, if you call it like that. And in the, with the type of B2B companies we work with, it's more what we call the SMB or enterprise market where you have this heavy um, human sales touch in the process. And so that's the key difference that impacts the sales cycle. But then as well, what is very similar still is we focus on always start with the ideal customer profile. Um, and I guess you also work with personas in, in B2C that you want to target, you know, the ideal uh, customers. Mm -hmm. and, and the main difference in B2B is that we have more stakeholders. So we'll have the decision makers, the influencers, and the bigger the companies, the more of decision makers and influencers you might have in the process. You might even have several layers of influencer called champions, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the key difference that uh, you need to keep in mind. But at the end of the day, uh, what we always say is that even if it's B2B, people still buy stuff for personal reason. And the personal reason they would buy it is you will help them to reach their KPIs faster. And, and of course, you being in the industry for, let's say, 10 years might help to have people picking up the phone when you call them. But at the end, they will not buy it because they know you. They will buy it because you help them to reach their KPIs faster. Mm -hmm. And they might get a bonus or might just get to keep their job or who knows, might just get home and watch more TV. Uh -huh. uh, but at the end, it's still personal reason. So what would you say is the most common mistake you see when you get involved with a company? Uh, companies who are in love with their products and don't talk enough with customers. Uh-huh. So they just, uh, they, f they feel like on B2B maybe that they, that they just come out with a solution and maybe don't need to do as much customer research as you would on consumer? Yeah, most likely. And I think this is just a problem of uh, the, uh, with human beings. We just tend to go more where we get uh, positive and uh, feedback or compliments. And what you get from customers is not always that. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but that's just how you grow. So how, how do you overcome the risk? I've, I've always had this assumption that um, you know, with B2C, if you're growing, there's, there's a pretty good chance that you have product market fit. But with B2B, maybe you got really good salespeople who are, who are selling a dream and the product just does not deliver on that and so you can be growing. How do, how do yeah, you? Yeah, and that, that's a very good point. And actually you mentioned, uh, well, the 
how this no start metric is important according to revenue. Yeah. And I've been with companies and part of sales floor where we just oversell it. And we are super fucking good at closing. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then eventually we get churn. Uh, because, you know, we have the new biz team that just has a new biz target, bring new business, new, new revenues. Then we give it to the customer success team and it's like, guys, we've done our job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they cannot deliver. Okay. And I think, and that's one of our other seven uh, key values, delivery, it's actually on the top. Okay. And, and why you need to align on then why I think if you focus so much on the personas uh, and making sure that you align on, that you are going to create value because you're going to help them to reach um, their KPIs, you can help a lot. Mm -hmm. Actually, one book that I'll um, mention a lot when I train salespeople is um, Delivering Happiness uh, by yeah. the guys from Zappos. Yeah who actually said that whenever customers cannot find the shoes they are looking for on Zappos, customer success or customer support, whatever, we look for shoes on whatever other website and send them the link. Mm -hmm. And they believe, they believe that this is how they deliver value and that people mm -hmm. will come back to Zappos because they still found the solution on Zappos. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it. It, it's very important as well for salespeople in B2B to be able to do the same. Like if you find out that the solution the customer is looking for is not yours, you still, and if you can, of course, suggest something else, and you will still deliver value. And next time you reach out, and the pain they have match your product, which is the painkiller, then they will still look at you like, oh, this guy delivered value to me already, right? Yeah. So they can do it again. And then you have the trust to, yeah, to be able to connect with exactly, them again. Exactly, yeah. So Thomas, let's, uh, let's talk a bit about Oberlo. Um, how, how long did it take for you to sell to Shopify from the time you started the business? Yeah, it was two years, actually. Two years. That's, a, that's amazingly fast. So what was it that you... I never knew that. Two <laughs> years? That's fucking it. <laughs> what was it that you sort of saw as a market opportunity that, that just... How, how did you know to go after that opportunity in, in a way that you would get enough traction to be an attractive acquisition target so quickly? Sure. So we never planned to sell. We actually tried to hire Thomas three yeah. years ago. <laughs> 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 but it didn't work out. Um, so I, th I think it, it, it links to the experimentation and, and to what you've just uh, talked about. Or maybe actually before that, when I said about Lithuanians don't speak English, I think we speak really well, uh, better than many other European nations. Absolutely. Uh, what I was referring to is what was more like uh, uh, to, to write a copy that sells right. it requires excellent knowledge uh, of language. and, and that Marketing speak. Yeah, that we don't <laughs> know. Uh, anyway, so uh, why, how a Burlo grew and, and how it links back to the growth uh, and growth framework that you've proposed uh, or talked about is uh, I think what is very important is actually the mission and the purpose before any experimentation because I mean, if, if, if Facebook didn't have an, an objective or a mission, uh, you could easily increase the daily active users by just sending more notifications on a mobile phone. Uh, so all the KPIs are very easily played, especially in bigger organizations. So I think it's very important to kind of nail down why you're doing what and, and how does that help users and why they're using that product. Um, so we launched a Burlo as Ali Importer. It actually helped people import products from AliExpress, which was a very kind of um, technical uh, transactional relationship where like we, we help, it was like a feature more mm -hmm. so than a business. Um, how we grew actually uh, links to this, uh, us understanding why we exist and how do we bring value to the merchants. Mm -hmm. um, we basically ask them, why do you use uh, Oberlo and, and how, how do you find it? What problem does it solve you? Uh, we basically talked with our customers and, um, and what they said is uh, they didn't use Oberlo to uh, complete a, 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 a kind of complete a task, uh, they used a burlo to uh, start a business. Mm. And for us, it kind of unlocked all the marketing opportunities that, hey, maybe our users are not the people who are looking to import products from somewhere to somewhere. Maybe our users are people who want to earn more money and travel the world. Right. That's a much bigger audience than the people who are actually starting kind of importing products from one place to another. Uh, and I think w once, once, we, once that was unlocked, and it was all qualitative, it, there was no data there, which is, you know, it doesn't sound great, but it's, it's just like us thinking about our business and, and what, what is the value that we're bringing and what is the opportunity out there. Yeah. Uh, and then from there we grew and, and that caught the attention of Shopify. Fantastic. And um, clearly Shopify is like one of the hottest rocket ships on the planet. So what, what did you learn about growth from Shopify because clearly they've got something figured out over there. Yeah, Shopify has, <laughs> has grown quite a bit. We've, uh, we've just talked. <laughs> uh, but uh, 
I think what you would find a chop for is unconventional thinking. If, if, if you know, all of these companies are following like pretty standard framework of growth and how people come in and how they get activated and move on. I think Shopify is unconventional in a way that um, it really went after the low end of, of the customers. If, if, if a traditional way of, of, of growing your uh, kind of revenue or customer base is, is you look at all the segments of your customers and, and you identify who are bringing the most money and where you have the, mo the biggest ROI and you would double down on them and you would bring more of them. I think what Shopify did, they looked at all of them and said, we are going after the low end even if they are not bringing any money. Mm -hmm. uh, because the reality is everyone starts somewhere, especially right. in, in the service that Shopify does. And uh, so all the Kylie Jenners, uh, all the Gym Sharks, uh, and all the other kind of unicorn e-commerce stores started as small. Um, and when you start with Shopify, it's pretty hard to s switch places. So um, I think it's similar to AWS, like uh, mm -hmm. it's a default starting place for many yeah. startups and it's very hard to switch uh, your hosting solution later on. So I think Shopify did that, uh, which is unconventional and I think that's just one of the many examples of how uh, differently Shopify thinks than the rest of the folks in the industry. Yeah, I actually heard the same thing about Zendesk that they, they got uh, Airbnb in the really early days and, and, uh, and then it turned into a massive client for them, but it, it was, it was kind of not a, not a big client when they joined there. So I think being able to, yeah, being able to serve companies and scale with companies can be, can be a really good strategy for getting rolling. Um, so clearly I think for, for um, definitely for TessoNet and, and probably for, for everyone, the, the difference between you know, running the business in the early days and then later on when, when you have lots and lots of people and all the challenges with that, what, what is, uh, how, how is it significantly different now than, than it maybe was in those early days from, from both like kind of operational and also continuing to serve customers and not become over siloed and keeping people focused on mission? Anyone want to take that? <laughs> yeah, so uh, then you're big. Uh, it's, uh, let's say, easy to think about growth because, you know, you have a lot of tools for that. Uh, you have money, you know, to invest. Uh, you have talent around you. You have experience. You have user base. Uh, you can even think about, you know, acquiring your competitor. Um, but then you are small, you know, uh, you are quite limited. So maybe your creativity works uh, mm. a bit better. So I personally believe it doesn't matter you are big or, or, or small, you, you know, you have to always think about growth. And um, yeah, you, you should always look for opportunities in product or marketing, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think you, you kind of want to replicate like little little companies within within your companies like little teams who who have that that similar drive and culture as you had when you were sitting with a smaller group together in the beginning and that's that's a bit tough but on the other hand if if you do it it creates uh, so much more fun because you get all these little groups who are like solving their own problems running their own businesses their jobs become more interesting and their output becomes better and the impact on businesses is, is bigger so i think that's like I just always try to think like how am I going to get this group of people into having an exciting, fun job? Right. And and I think that you know trying to 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 to, to stimulate that type of behavior helps a lot because actually what he what he says is it's it's very true. You, you can very easily get lazy and, and think like well let, let's just buy these competitors out and <laughs> let's let's move on with this bullshit. But it's much nicer to to set up a team to kill that competitor and like right. come up with all kind of creative stuff to do that. And I, I think it's just more exciting. And, and I think that's a hard thing, of course. Obviously, when you have a thousand people or, or even more, it becomes more and more difficult. Yeah, and so it's interesting. I think that the, the, the kind of trying to get people passionate about the mission and, and, and you, you mentioned like the, the fun of success and the challenge of that. And then you compare that to the number of companies that feel like, oh, we need to, we need to bring in ping pong tables and, and you know, do, do things to kind of create a fun culture where it, it just, it seems foreign to me that, 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 that the pursuit of success would not be fun in and of itself. So it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting <laughs> contrast. And you know, it's fun, then you can buy your competitor faster than two years. 
But I, I think another way to put it that is that over time, uh, people start focusing more on the internal things rather than external. So when you're a very small startup, everything you hear about is how to get more customers, what customers are telling about you, what is the CAC, like all these opportunities out there. And as you grow, people just care about the internal stuff, like what tools you use, what are the procedures, who's reporting to who, and how does that work. Yeah. And I think if in line with kind of building small teams or staying creative, I think it's how do you keep everyone focused on the external size because all the opportunities mm. of growth are out there. Right. It's not actually within. Um, so I think that is uh, an extremely important point. Oh, I love that. Yeah, and you should not hire people who care about a ping pong table. Right. Because that's like, they should become professional ping pong players. <laughs> right. and, like you should hire people who are passionate about building stuff and building it together with you. And I think yeah. filtering out that in the beginning, especially when you're like cool company like Tessonet and you give big events and everybody's like, that's nice. They'll probably have good pancakes at breakfast. And like, <laughs> wait, you know, those wait, people, wait. You, need to, you need to make sure that they don't join your company. Right, right. And the guys who are, don't give a, oh, sorry, don't, don't care too much about doing the unsexy stuff, but really love to build things, those are people who are actually, I think, similar to us and, you know, will build a company that, that you know, can afford ping pong tables. Right. So I, th I think that brings us to a pretty good transition of, uh, what is the difference between companies that just achieve this breakout success and, and so many other companies kind of languish and, and go out of business? What, what do you think some of the key factors in, uh, on, the, on the two binary outcomes are? Look, if, if we knew, we would be incredibly rich. <laughs> we wouldn't be CEOs of these companies. We would run the world. No. <laughs> so, so in other words, maybe luck? I think luck is a big factor, but it's also like uh, having teams that work really hard for it. And, and I think there's so many different successful companies that, you know, if there was a very simple five points to point out what to mm -hmm. do, uh, you know, that th it would be very clear. But I think to nobody that is. And I think all of us have very different stories on how we reach in different times success. Right. So I think um, the only thing that you know is that nobody knows. And yeah. you have to try a lot of stuff. Why do you talk about doing so many experiments? Because nobody knows. Right. And and you just try a lot of stuff. You work really hard. At a certain point in time, you hit something. You're like, oh my god, this is working. Well, let's try something similar again, and let's see if that builds up. Right. So it's, I think you need to just work hard and try a lot. Yeah. And yeah, you need to be fast learner every time because you know we saw in examples like examples like uh, Yahoo or Nokia. Uh, they were at the top, you know, and uh, I thought uh, it's impossible to beat mm -hmm. companies like, like these. But actually, when you are a fast learner, uh, you're curious, so you can achieve whatever you want. Uh, but yeah, hard work also uh, comes together and uh, other stuff. Yeah, and I guess the pattern I see walking with so many successful entrepreneurs uh, is maybe brutal honesty. So to have this capacity exactly when you run Nokia to say, are we brutally honest with ourselves yeah. right now? Are we really passing We're in on trouble with here. Yeah, or <laughs> whatever, right? Yeah. No, we are so big, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that this kind of mindset of being always brutally honest with yourself on the team uh, is hard to keep probably and, and maybe it's one of the patterns we see in successful companies here. Yeah. Right, right. I, I like the brutal honest uh, piece. Uh, what I would add to that is that it's it's pretty hard to see what you can't see, and I think that's where uh, kind of the diversity comes in, in terms of you building a company and making sure that there are people who understand things that you don't understand. Um, so f to grow a successful company, you really need uh, a representation of everything, and if you are, we kind of talked a lot about, about, a lot about this uh, lately, but you really need, uh, a representation of, of everything within the company that will help you find all these blind spots mm -hmm. um, that you can't see because um, I think kind of the folks at, at Yahoo, at Nokia and, and other companies that failed, they, they basically didn't see what they didn't see. Right. Uh, wi which is, you know, how, how could you solve for that? Yeah, it's a, it's a scary lesson for a lot of people. Hopefully it's, uh, it's, it's one that, that keeps people's eyes a little wider open when you see big, big giants like that fall. The, there are more examples like brandless, all the SoftBank investments, uh, yeah. the, the, the pizza delivery truck, and right. and WeWork and, and others. So yeah, absolutely. So even yeah, perceived hot new companies sometimes are are a little more smoke and mirrors than they 
than they may seem. So I, I do think, though, that um, you know, one of the things that, Thomas, you, you had mentioned was the, uh, you, you went in and, and the team hadn't really articulated what the value was at Vinted. I think a lot of times that, um, and I was kind of joking when I said, is it just luck? But, but I, I do think that in creating value in the first place, there is a little bit of luck involved there. That, that you mean, it starts with, it's not that hard to validate that a problem exists, but to get the solution right that, that addresses that problem is, is pretty tough. Yeah, and, and if you listen to these things, because I agree a lot with what they're saying, actually what you hear is like, how do I increase my probabilities to luck, right? Yeah. I'm gonna uh, take a lot of different people that look at this problem from a different angle. So I got like many different ways to look at it, which increase my probability of seeing it. I'm gonna be very honest about what doesn't work because right. then I can write off a lot of stuff. I'm not gonna lie to myself, pretend things are, are there. And then I'm gonna try effortlessly to, to do that. And you know, if you look at it, those are all ingredients that you know, tries to you know, gamble with that luck because right. in, in the end, all those things that you're building, usually they've not been built unless you're rocket internet and you're copying a wor working <laughs> model. But, you know, it's, it's actually a good approach because yeah. you eliminate a lot of that luck. Sure. Uh, but uh, um, so, so I think in those cases, it's a lot about, you know, how, how can I increase probabilities? And, right. uh, um, and being humble about it that, you know, many of these things are luck, you know? Yeah. And, and when you got something, then really try to operate on that lucky bit yeah. really well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So once, you, once, you've, once you've created that value, work hard to understand that value, understand how you create that value, understand all of the elements that, that build on that value and then just turn it up as much as you can. So there's that execution and hard work and building the right team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And when you found that luck, realize it's luck, right? Because, yeah. because don't think you're super smart because you're not. <laughs> like you're not. And, and I mean, if you look at the SoftBank success, that guy who had that thing, you know, he got very lucky with uh, uh, his previous investments in China specifically one company that did really well, doesn't mean that every time you throw a bunch of money at something, it's gonna work, you yeah, know? Yeah. So, so really realize, like, okay, I got lucky this time, I'm gonna keep on doing the same thing of being humble and trying a lot of stuff to make right. sure this luck keeps on running, instead of thinking, well, we were so smart, you know, two yeah. years we <laughs> sold the company, oh, I'm so smart, we went up, ah, oh, that's not so big, we're so smart. No, we're not, man, we got lucky a couple times and right. we were willing to continue to, to in invent on top of that. Yeah, it reminds me when I uh, when I left Log Me In, so much of our growth was was buying intent. People were looking for remote access solutions because we had a competitor who was spending hundreds of millions of dollars building demand and charging a lot for a product that we gave away for free. So we would just buy through search engines. Yeah, same thing, but free. So we didn't even focus on differentiation. It was just like harvesting all of that. And then they get to Dropbox thinking, oh, that playbook, I can't wait to do it again. And nobody was looking for Dropbox. Nobody knew what the heck a Dropbox was. And so it was just, it's that, that when you think you've got it figured out, being able to recognize pretty quickly that like, you know what? I got to figure out a new playbook because this one's not going to work. And uh, so it could be a little scary. <laughs> Cool. So any, any parting uh, words that you want to share with everyone out here? And I'm not sure if we are supposed to open up for questions, but, uh, but we'll, we'll have some parting words and then uh, maybe questions over beer afterwards. <laughs> What's the one recommendation you would give someone who's, uh, who's, who's trying to make their business a success? Yeah, so... Uh I would. I, I really like the way to look at it uh, probabilistically to your success. So it's not binary. It's not a failure or success. We are all kind of working on something that has a chance, and your goal is to maximize that chance. Um, and and I think one important thing, uh, which is kind of my uh, takeaway, is. Uh, when you look at it probabilistically, you want to kind of make sure that uh, the upside is really big because yeah. you multiply the upside by the probability to get the expected value. And, and then if your upside is, you know, taking over Lithuania, that's a probability of 10 over 3 million people, which is a very not exciting thing. Uh, so you really, you really have to ask yourself a question, now, not whether that, that's going to work, but if, if it's going to work, how, how big it can be. And I think that's a huge takeaway that we in Lithuania especially sometimes tend to like overlook. We, we really focus on kind of just the local market. So really aim big because um, kind of the success will be eventual kind of the function of, 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 of probability and, and, and upside.
Yeah, and I would, I, would, I would take that and say anytime you're doing any individual test that, that being able to have a lot of upside on any individual test is, makes it more likely mm -hmm. that if, if it's successful, it can be a game changer in your business. So, yeah. Um, any other parting words? Uh, I guess based on that and what you were saying earlier about, you know, uh, figuring out in one place and it doesn't work necessarily the next time is probably also set expectations that if you're about to start something or already working for something, don't look for shortcuts. There are none. And that's a sad, sad reality, right? That yeah. uh, you just like, and I see uh, many f salespeople or founders trying to kind of copy paste some playbook. It's like playbooks are there for inspirations for you to mm -hmm. kind of tweak on, but yeah, yeah. you cannot just copy paste it and assume it's going to work and that's going to be your shortcut to market. Right. Uh, maybe it worked with bitcoins <laughs> 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 back in the days, but yeah, that was the exception to the rules. Absolutely. I would suggest uh, not only look for huge improvements, but for small ones as well, because you know when you have five percent uh, conversion rate uh, increasement uh, uh, per month, uh, and when you combine you know all these uh, improvements, and uh, you can see in the end of the year that it's eighty percent, for example. So. Yeah, and when we you know divided our business into very uh, uh, into a lot of different uh, small parts and try to improve each of each of, uh, of, of, of those. So, you know, uh, after one or two years, you know, we saw 500 or 600 uh, percent you know, improvement. So um, you can be very successful if you, you know, try to, to look for growth in every part uh, you know, of your business. Mm -hmm. Love it. Good. So I agree with, with those points, and I think to the point of, uh, of, of Thomas, so from the Thomas corner then, I think <laughs> uh, um, I, I really like the point, and I think when you make those bets in the beginning and you start to think about, you re really realize and don't be ashamed about the fact that you're going to fail like 10, 15 times before you're really going to find it. So don't, don't, don't feel shame in, in, in failing, be honest about it, and be don't be thinking about, you know, it's going to be a sexy ride, I'm going to be co-founder, I'm going to be CEO, you know, all the sexy stuff. No, man, <laughs> it's the unsexy stuff that make the business work, right. and that means failing 10 times. And I think all of us at least failed it 10 to 15 times before we got something working. And, and, and I think if you put that mindset on and you put it in the probabilistic stuff and realize these things that small changes matter, then all, all of that together, you know, might, might get you there. Right. But, but realize it's just going to be tough. Like, I think all of us have gone through super tough periods and, and many of our teams as well. And, and it's not a sexy ride, you know, get ready for that if you want to start doing this stuff. Right. Absolutely. So uh, the, the one thing I would, I would leave uh, on top of everything else is just figure out what matters right now in your business, figure out that thing that matters the most. And so for some, it might be, do we have any value at all? That's the, that kind of product market fit. Do we have a product that anybody wants? Once you know that some people want it, then it might be how, how well do we articulate it? How do we start to get enough people in the door? And then eventually maybe it's how do we start to find massively scalable channels and how do we fix the support problem or whatever it is, but just putting a lot of energy behind the thing that matters most in your business at any given time, it gives you the, the highest likelihood of actually being able to solve it. Excellent. Well, thank you guys. That was that was fantastic. I really appreciate it. Thank you.